We've seen how the input power and rotation speed of a gear can be used for calculating the tangential force at the teeth of a spur gear. With this tangential force, we can find two things. First, the torque that goes into the second gear and shaft, and second, the overall contact force between gears, which allows us to find the reaction forces at the bearing that supports the shaft that carries the gear. These reaction forces are useful for two things. First, to find the maximum bending moment within the shaft, either on an inclined plane, if all the gear forces and reaction forces are parallel to each other, or by using the force components to find maximum bending by using shear and bending moment diagrams in two orthogonal planes, like we've done before, link below, and second, to find the radial forces that the bearings will be subjected to, which allows us to select or design the bearings for our system. We've calculated this tangential force component that allows us to do all of this that I just mentioned in metric units using kilowatts for power and newton meters for torque, and also in English units using horsepower for power and pound inches for torque. With this basic comprehension out of the way, we can look at how the contact force components are related in the other types of gears. So let's begin with the helical gears. The interaction forces between the teeth of two mate helical gears is perpendicular or normal to the surface where the contact occurs, just like any other normal force, like I pointed out during the last video, link below. For this reason, we know that the force will not be perpendicular to the axis of the gear like it is in spur gears, but it will be oriented at an angle psi, the helix angle I mentioned during the last video. And because of the profile or shape of the teeth, the pressure angle phi will still be there. For these reasons, the force will have three components. Tangential WT, which is the one that we can calculate from the power and speed information, radial WR, and in this case, as opposed to the spur gears, axial WA, in the direction of the axis of the gear. We also call this force component the thrust. The horizontal component of the main force vector that we can obtain by multiplying it by the cosine of the pressure angle can be further decomposed into the tangential and axial components by using the helix angle. The adjacent side, and therefore the component using the cosine for the tangential component, and the opposite side, and therefore the component using the sine for the axial component. As I mentioned in a previous video, these axial components will try to move the shaft on its axis, and the bearings must counteract them. These axial loads will also be of much importance when selecting or designing bearings. Additionally, these axial loads will effectively also cause the shaft to undergo axial loading, either compressing or tensing sections of the shaft, but just like I explained in a shaft-centered video before, link below, the stresses that these axial loads will generate are negligible when compared to the torsion and the bending, so that won't be an issue. The main reason we care about the axial component of the gear force is for the reaction forces at the bearings and having enough information to select proper bearings. The radial component of the force would be the opposite side of the triangle with the pressure angle, and therefore its expression is only W times sine of phi. Now remember that what we usually find first is the tangential component, not the overall vector of force W. So if we write these expressions in terms of WT, not W, we get expressions that we will use more often. Let's take a look at a 3D render of a helical gear with some of the forces and the force components. The green vector represents the full force W, and we see that it's normal to the surface it affects. Looking at the gear from the top shows us that both the full vector in green and the red vector we started with are perpendicular to the angle of the teeth, or the helix angle. And by looking at it from the side, we see that the angle formed between the full vector in green and the component that is tangential to the gear is the pressure angle. Rotating it slightly, we see the tangential component that we can calculate from the power and rotation speed information. Let's look at our drawing and compare it to this view. I will link this part file in the description of this video for you to take a look at it in SOLIDWORKS. Now let's take a look at the bevel gears. Recalling the phrasing I used for describing their shape, the conical shape, we can identify what we call the pitch angle. Since bevel gears go hand in hand with other bevel gears, usually, we use the Greek letters gamma or capital gamma. These are usually part of the specs of the gear, or you can calculate the angle from the dimensions of your setup. For example, using the tangent function between the diameters or the radii of your gears. 
Just like spur gears or helical gears, the information that you would find from the power and rotation speed values is the tangential component of the force. And this force, that in reality is a pressure, can be represented as a point load right at the pitch circle, which is the average between the two circles you see. The overall force, just like in helical gears, would be perpendicular to the surface of the teeth. The angle between the tangential component in green and the overall force in red would be that of the pressure angle. Not from the side view, nor from the top view, but exactly from a slanted plane that allows me to see the involute profile of the teeth exactly from the side. For this reason, the tangential component would be the overall vector w times cosine of phi, the pressure angle. And since what we can find is the tangential component, what we actually want is the full vector w in terms of wt. Now this vector also has two other components, the radial and the axial components. And both will be given by that pitch angle gamma. The radial component the force going into the center of the gear will be the adjacent side of the triangle with gamma in it using a pink hypotenuse and the axial component, the component that is parallel to the axis of the gear, will be the opposite side of that same triangle, meaning the hypotenuse times sine of gamma. Now what is that pink hypotenuse? When looked at this from the side, the pink hypotenuse is the length from the beginning of the green vector to the beginning of the red vector, which can be calculated with the pressure angle. And this is all we need. The radial component can be written by substituting F and then W, and the axial component exactly the same way. Simplifying the trigonometric functions, I can find the three expressions for each one of the components. And now we have expressions for the components of the bevel gear forces in terms of the pressure angle and the pitch angle gamma and expressions for the components of the forces of helical gears in terms of the pressure angle phi and the helix angle psi. All of this basic geometry and trigonometry. So let's take a look at a simple example using helical gears. An electric motor is transmitting one horsepower at 1800 revs per minute, which makes shaft A rotate in the direction shown. A helical gear with a 1.5 inch diameter is attached to that shaft. This helical gear is a right hand helical gear with a helix angle of 30 degrees. Connected to it is another gear twice the size that rotates on shaft B, which is supported by bearings A and B. What are the axial and the radial reactions at the bearings AB if they're both equidistant from gear 3? Once again, because the bearings are at the same distance from gear 3, each one of them will counteract half of the forces that gear 2 exerts on gear 3. Because the gears are helical, we know there's going to be three components to the interaction force between them. And from what we learned today and in the previous video, the one component we can calculate right off the bat with the power and the rotation speed information is the tangential force that gear 2 exerts on gear 3. If gear 2 is rotating in the direction the figure shows, it means that gear 3 would be rotating in the opposite direction, which means that the tangential force from gear 2 to 3 is what's causing that rotation motion. The torque that the motor is producing to be transferred by gear 2 would be found just like we've done before, with 1 horsepower being 550 foot-pounds per second and multiplying by 12 to get that torque in pound inches instead of pound feet. If we divide this torque by the radius of gear 2, we would find the tangential force that the torque is overcoming for the sum of torques to be zero and the angular acceleration to be zero as well. And now pay close attention to what I'm going to do, because I'm not really going to use the expressions or memorize the equations to get each one of the components. The red vector in the xy plane is perpendicular to the teeth of the helical gear, and this is what we know as the helix angle. The angle between the xy plane and the total vector w would be the pressure angle. This means that the red vector is the hypotenuse of a triangle with a psi angle and an adjacent side with the tangential component. Within the green and red triangle, I could find the radial component of the force. This radial component is the opposite side of a triangle with the pressure angle phi and the red vector as the adjacent side. And finally, the axial component could be found from the blue and red triangle, a triangle with a psi angle and an adjacent side W23T. This axial component is what we know as the thrust, 
So half of it will be supported by bearing A and the other half by bearing B. This does not cause bending and as I mentioned before, we don't take it into account for the design of the shaft. This is information we'll use when selecting a bearing. The radial and tangential components will indeed cause bending to the shaft and they'll be counteracted by the bearings as well. Alternatively, you can always use the expressions we derived, but the result would be the same. The only reason I do this process graphically using geometry and trigonometry is for you to remember that the procedure is easy enough to not have to memorize equations. If you want to see another problem where we find the components of a bevel gear, make sure to check out the link in the description below. In the next video, we will take a quick look at the components of worm gears and we will solve for their reaction forces and torques within different shafts of a more complex gear system. Thanks for watching.